angle, maybe your feet will look less, less purple. We can hope. I need to do something better in the 5x5 five five CMS for when, when there's video. When a show with video is broadcasting video, mm -hmm. then I want to... Have like I, I want to have it automatically go to the video page instead of the audio page first. Does that make sense? Yes. I don't have a lot of links, but I've got a few good ones. I am tweeting it out right now. Yeah, this, this Google Maps silliness with the Pac-Man. Um, and I recorded track... Uh, Skype too, because I'm never sure if you want to do calls or not. Oh yeah, I don't that's think I'll do any thing. calls today, okay. but um. But yeah, then I did the soundboard. That's and... fine. I'll I'll turn track okay. two. I can just hide it. Okay. Hide the track, so we don't have to have that. Like one, two, and you you forgot to do Alexa. It looks like Alexa's... she's on track four, so oh. we want to make sure that we record her. Can we name her? You want track to call four, her Alexa? That would help me, but I can just remember if you. If that's well, better. what if we have like a human over over there? On on that mic over there. Yeah. What if that mic isn't Alexa? It's just a fourth voice in the room. We could put Alexa in parentheses. <laughs> and then it, we would have to make this part of the screen larger to fit the extra word, and we would also have a character, a different character, strange character that's not just numeric, it could be a symbol. It is tweeted out. Thank you. You feeling good? No. Why? I'm just I'm tired. I'm super tired. Good means not tired. All right. Oh, look, you, you sent it up there. Look at look at how long my hair is. It's great. I think you should. Cut. Yep. I think I should do the whole show in profile like that. Yep. So people can enjoy that. That'd be pretty good. Put a good, hair light huh? on you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I do. No, we do need hair lighting in here. Look at that. All right. She'll cut it all off. I think I should go back to a buzz cut. We'll talk about that on the show. All right. <clears throat> I'm ready okay. if you are ready. Pending, contract, uh, pending contact request for Jeff. Oh, I Bing. think he'll be there. He said he'd be there. I trust him. Okay. You ready to do this? Okay. You ready? Yes. Okay. This is the Dan Benjamin Hour for Thursday, April 2nd, 2015. A little overcast here in Austin, Texas, but we're doing the show anyway. That's the way, uh, that's the way we do things. We had some nice barbecue yesterday, uh, Hattie. Yep. Did you enjoy the barbecue? Oh that, my that gosh, that it tastes better every time that we go. Where did we go yesterday? We went to Micklewaite's Barbecue. That's my personal your personal favorite. favorite. Mm -hmm. The more that I eat there, the more that I feel like I like, uh, the more that I feel like I like our actual uh, La Barbecue restaurant uh, or the truck better. These You're are trucks. This is what people yeah. need to understand: is when we talk food about barbecue, trucks. we're we're in a we're essentially in a we're going up to a food truck. You park and then you walk over to the truck. And it is a trailer. It's a large trailer. Usually there's a smoker if it's a barbecue place nearby. And you stand in line out in front of it. And then the food comes out of it somehow. And you eat. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. And, like, before I moved to Austin and I heard people talking about, oh, we eat at a, we eat at a food truck. I was like, wow, that sounds really horrible. What kind of food could possibly <laughs> right. come out of a food truck? It sounds sounds terrible. It is. It sounds like it would be awful. And uh, instead, it, it's been... It's been amazing. It's changed my life trailer, for the better. Food trailer food might be better or just it just the quality of food trailer food is amazing. Yeah, it's really great food. Don't let so that spook you. So I've been working on a, on a little guide of the best places to go in Austin when you want bar good barbecue. We've been that's been one of our little pet projects in our copious free time. Uh, but I've been I've been you know, I did another show uh, yesterday with Jim Dalrymple <laughs> and it was, it was very good. Very good. I had a good time with him. He's back. He's back on his game, but he's recording. He's actually recording out of a car, it seems like. Like, he's in a, he's in a car. Was he in a car this week He was in well? the car again. Hmm. He was in a car again. And, and the joke on the show, and I don't know if it's real or not, is that he's living out of his car. Jim Dalrymple, the host of, uh, or creator, I should say, and main, main writer of The Loop, an Maybe Apple Maybe he's website. living out of the Apple car. 
Yeah, that would That's, make it. He's doing research. That would make it a little more interesting if he was. See, I feel like now, since you've got the camera over here, and Did now I? I'm looking at this. Uh huh. You're right. I'm. Uh, it looks like I'm looking at the camera a little more yeah. when I'm looking at uh, at this thing. Or Does the chat room have any complaints? Do jackals have any complaints right now? I need to make one. What is there a spider? Is there a spider? No. What is no, it? Is there a spider? What are you doing? What is that? Oh, look at that! Hold on, let me switch the room camera so oh, so we can't see Hattie in the shot. We can't see you in the shot. We can't see you in the shot. There you are. All right. Oh, right, because it's cut. Look at that. There's a wire in front of my shot. You don't have a choice. You've got to move the room shot. There. That's fine. Looks good. That's good. Uh huh. Yeah, Hattie's rearranging cameras in the room during during the show. Thank you, Hattie. Where's my theater of the mind sound bite? <laughs> For that because we don't we don't have so I do I, I was able to get uh, my soundboard back but I won't be overusing it the way we have fun with it on the frequency I won't be doing that here but uh, we do have jingles that, that are, we're going to be recording and we'll have uh, just in, following in Jeff Kanata style I think yes Jeff Kanata is a con I, all I want to do is be more like Jeff each morning I wake up and I say how can I be a little more like Jeff today so that's why I've been working out you know, I've been I've been uh, leaning, getting TV ready because he's so good. He's so good. Listen to DLC. If you guys don't listen to DLC, shame on you. Uh, but here's my theater of the mind. The theater of the mind. So there you go. That's for the, uh, the audio listeners. We do the show every day at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern time and 10 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. on the Pacific time. So you can listen while you're driving in. And then I go, and as soon as the show's done, I go and edit it uh, myself. I run into the other room, and I edit the show, and I get it out there for you guys to listen to. That's my goal every single day, to rush out there and, and get it out as quickly as possible. But if you want to watch us or listen to us record the show, you can do that live by going to 5by5.tv slash live or danbenjamin.com slash live, where you'll see the video, because we have four cameras here that show you behind-the-scenes video. It's a high-end it's a high-end Hollywood-style production here. And speaking of high-end production, something I didn't get to yesterday, uh, GoDaddy is doing this IPO. And their initial public offering was going to be at $20 per share. Company is valued at $4.5 billion to get, you know, that's what they pay for Danica Patrick to, uh, to drive around the track. That's how much they have to pay her. That's crazy. Yeah, that's not true. <laughs> Here's some interesting news today, and something that is very interesting to me. There all have been these rumors for a long time that Apple was going to make a TV that we quickly decided that after talking and talking about it, maybe not so quickly, decided that that's not the real deal. It's not. They're, they are not making a TV. Apple is not making a TV. The Apple TV is not a TV. Why would they make a TV? They can barely make, they can barely make a, a desktop screen. In 2015, Apple can barely make in there. Yeah, go ahead, caller. I know why. Why? Because they don't want you to be tied down to your couch. They want you to be able to watch Mobily wherever you are. Watch Mobily, title. <laughs> but uh, well, I agree with you. They do want you to watch on your devices. Why would they make a TV? They make a set-top box because they want to be in that space. And apparently, this is over on uh, Recode, Peter Kafka, no, no relation, is talking how, about an article that he published saying Apple wants the TV guys to provide their shows for its proposed streaming video service that, that they've been working on in secret. But they want them to provide the streams too. Apple is asking TV networks to handle, this is a quote from, uh, from, from, I mean, Peter. Apple is asking TV networks to handle the responsibility and cost of the streaming infrastructure associated with its web video service. That issue is one of the many unresolved questions about the proposed service, which Apple would like to launch next fall, but can't until it lines up programming deals. Why would Apple have to stream that? All these networks are doing it anyway. Fox is doing it. CBS is doing it. Disney is doing it. They've got their own streams. Why would Apple redo that? It's pretty affordable to get these streams out to people. So why would Apple have to redo that? That makes sense. Hattie, why don't we have Fra I mean uh, Peter? Peter Kafka on the show today to talk about this? We should have Peter Kafka. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, I like Hattie. to think of Greg as he books the guests and, what do you and do? I just fill in the holes. <laughs> really? Is that <laughs> what, did you say that? Yep. Comcast is leapfrogged Google Fiber 
There, oh my God! Here we are in. Let me just say, here we are in Austin, Texas, right? The second, the second Silicon Valley, as the, as uh, they call it here, startup friendly city of Austin, Texas, where Google Fiber's pick for one of the first places to go and roll out their fiber, right? Thank you, Google. Did you start the stream, Hattie? The audio stream for anyone? No. No. Why don't I do that then? Okay. <laughs> I thought you were producing. No, I don't start streaming until you're sitting. But you didn't start the stream. Right, because you were already sitting at the desk. You can remote to it. It's it's the name of the machine yes. is Mopac Streamer. I know. I can we do have that. finally have a naming convention. Yes. Uh, hit Hattie. Hit the inside baseball uh, sound effect. It's inside baseball. Do 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 do. Okay. Uh, oh, actually, that's pretty good. Secrets. Yeah. So inside baseball, uh, we, uh, we finally came up with a naming convention. We've been struggling for a long time on what to name the different computers that we use in the two different rooms. And since this one is right next to, to Mopac, you can't see it, but Mopac is uh, one of our uh, beautiful highways that we have here in Austin, Texas. Uh, this, uh, this particular highway is right outside that window. So guess what? We called all the things in this room Mopac. So we got, we got uh, the, all, the, all different machines start with the word Mopac now. So Mopac Streamer. Hattie, you're the producer. Produce. Got okay, it? Okay. Got it. Comcast is Leapfrog Google Fiber. Austin, Texas, supposedly the second Silicon Valley, right? You know how much I pay? I have cable internet here in this, in this office. At home, I get 300 down, and I think it's 100 up at home over cable modem. Oh, it's shared, but I'll tell you what. It's super fast. It takes seconds to download stuff. Seconds to upload stuff. I think it costs me about 60 bucks a month at home to get that at home. 60 bucks. That's not bad. That's really, I'm very happy with my home internet connection. I don't want to jinx it. Here at the office for cable modem, uh -huh. 35 down, five up is 350 bucks a month. <laughs> and we've had more outages here than I've had anywhere since I lived in Florida. We've had days here where it's it's like six hours of no internet. And what do at they all. do about it when that happens? Nothing. Nothing. N a whole lot of nothing. That's what they do about it. So, whoa! Why don't you get Google Fiber? I thought they were in Austin. First of all, they are in Austin. Second of all, Austin is a big place. It's a big place. It's not as big as like Dallas or Houston, but it's it's big and it's growing. Very quickly. Yes. That's what she said. Anyway, <laughs> Austin <laughs> has Google Fiber in South Austin. And they're right to start in South Austin. They're right to start down there because that's where the hipsters live. But if they want, you know, when they move up here to Northwest Austin, beautiful. Gosh, I wish you could see out this window. Even though it's an overcast day, it's gorgeous. Northwest Austin is beautiful. Hills, it's, it's not like what you think of when you think of Texas. And I'll tell you what. If they were going to be out here, they would have all the business connectivity and all the, the families and homes would be very, very happy. 350 bucks a month I spend for cable. Now, they have offered me fiber here. For 10 up and 10 down, it would be 400 bucks a month. Can you believe that? 10, 10, 400 bucks a month here just because we're in an office. It's, uh, it's the worst. Anyway, Comcast is going to be offering two GBPS internet service in Atlanta, Fatlanta, Hotlanta, bringing it to 18 million American homes by the end of the year. Who doesn't want fiber right to their house? It's just crazy. They need to get out here. I want, I want more choices. Time Warner Cable has us pinned down here. We're underneath their thumb. Time Warner Cable is the only thing that I can get where I live. Yeah. I can't get the uh, Grande. I can't get AT&T U-verse. Nothing. Nothing. Just that. Nothing. That's all we got. Oh, you can get AT&T here, but then you're going to be cut down to even less, slower speeds Yeah. for the same price. Slower speeds. Sounds like a great idea. I'm going to tell you about, uh, there's an article, Ben Popper. Ben Popper. Why don't we have Ben Popper on? The, I thought that we were friends with The Verge. We are. Greg. 
you know, Greg is great, uh, but I want him to put, like, why doesn't he have Ben Popper? Ben Popper has a good article out on The Verge right now, Ben Popper. Before I talk about that, he has an, he's explained why Meerkat is history. Do I still have my toilet flushing sound? I think you do. I need to, someone came in here and changed all of my sound effects in here. I'm not going to overdo them. I just want to be able to have, you know, have a couple of sounds for, for when a company is going downhill. I want to be able to, to play my sound. Okay. <laughs> but before I tell you about Meerkat, let me tell you about our friends over at Linda. And I do love Linda. And every single day that I use Linda, I learn a little something about technology. Because there's a lot to learn. And you think that's silly. You think you know everything, but you don't. Linda is spelled L-Y-N-D-A. Linda is the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses that help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. They're giving a free 10-day trial to uh, listeners of the Dan Benjamin Hour, which they have told me is the best, uh, the best podcast that they've ever heard. And uh, I agree. Linda.com slash DBH is the URL to go to. They have so many really wonderful courses there. They let you jump in, and you're going to learn something, and you're going to get in, and you're going to get out. You're not going to spend hours and hours hoping that the content that you're looking for is in that video, but it could be about anything you want. You want to learn about Excel. You want to learn about Photoshop. You want to learn income tax fundamentals, growth hacking fundamentals. I don't even know what that means. Getting things done with David Allen. David Allen himself there. They get the pros. Up and running with IFTTT. What I love about Linda is that you can just jump in and learn something that you want to learn. Oh, I want to learn how to do transitions in Final Cut Pro. I don't want to learn the basics of Final Cut Pro and spend two hours learning how to, you know, set up a show. That's not what I'm there for. I want to learn one little thing. You can use their search. You can find what you want to learn, and you have access to every single video because uh, it's a flat rate. So if you want to get in there and, and learn for 10 days for free, Linda, Linda.com. Slash DBH is the place to go. Thanks very much to Linda for supporting this uh, this program. It's a fine program we're putting out for you. Meerkat's popularity is plunging. Let me tell you why. Ben Popper, he has some good reasons. He's got it figured out. All of a sudden, it's South by Southwest. Every single person at South by is talking about Meerkat, Meerkat, Meerkat. There's Meerkats of Gary Vaynerchuk hanging out with uh, with the founder of Meerkat at South by Southwest. I mean, how could, what more could you ask for? As a company starting out, what more could you possibly ask for? But then they started to fall off the cliff. What happened? Why? Ben Popper has some answers. He says, Meerkat founder and CEO Ben Rubin says the company was featured in the App Store for a week. They saw a huge spike in downloads, and they're now simply back to where they began. Well, I'm okay. Let me uh, comment there. Just simply back to where you began to me, that sounds absolutely terrible. You don't want to ever go backwards. We call that a uh, backpedaling. Uh, back, back, well, back, yeah. Back spin. spin. Backwash. Backwash. Undertow. Lots of terms. They have fallen to where they were. That's bad. There is a little expression. Once you get it up, keep it up. And that's what I would like to say to, to Ben Rubin, who, by the way, was not on the show. We invited him to be on the show, but he was too busy for us. Very busy dude. He was too busy for us. I like Meerkat. Now, to, for me, I'm rooting for Meerkat. Meerkat is the underdog now. Yep. They were like the, 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 the big ones, and now they're the underdog. Periscope came out. and uh, right. You don't want to root for the app that Twitter comes out with. Right. Like You'd be like, yeah, it's good, whatever. Exactly. But you want to, you want to. So now I'm rooting for Meerkat. But anyway, he says, oh, they're simply back to where they began, but that's not a good place to be, guys. Meerkat's popularity is sliding because its hype got ahead of its actual traction, and we're now seeing a correction at the press, as the press and promotion dies down. And if you're, if you're following along at home, you can see this beautiful chart. And the chart shows the rank history on the iPhone of downloads. And where Meerkat was beginning and then ending. Provided to them by App Annie. Well, Periscope comes out. Look at, look at the tweets per day about Meerkat and Periscope. 
Periscope in the blue, Meerkat in the orange. Wow. But here's something that's worth noting is that it looks to me like Meerkat peaked and then started to be declining. But then came right back. Came back, but then decline again. And look look at where Periscope is. Periscope is up in that 50K mark. You never want the toward chart the, uh, to look like this. Toward the end, yeah. <laughs> Do that again, that weird. Isn't that the uh, Texas prof, prof. the Texas State? What's the Texas State one? Um, hold How on. do you do it? Wait. It's, you have to do it with the correct hand. This is the bobcat claw. Uh-huh. And then this is that the looks state like a of Texas. That's what they're doing. And it, your fingers point to San Marcos. Can you describe what, what um, just happened there? So you hold your hand up as if you're going to give someone a high five. The your left hand. And then you... Put your All right, and, uh, enough of that crap. <laughs> Meerkat slide in the app store inspired a blistering editorial from Tiro. Okay. <laughs> from Tiro. I don't know how to say this person's uh, name. Cute. 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 Who bashed the journalists and investors praising it as the next big thing. Quote, there is also no doubt that if Jared Leto and his merry band had realized a week ago that Meerkat would drop out of the top 500 iPhone app chart by Sunday night, they would have slammed their checkbooks shut in a hurry. They were obviously blinded by the tech journalism flim flammery uh, that has gone on unabated in America in recent weeks. You know, I was shocked that they went from we're a brand new app to we have $14 million from Jared Leto and other people. It's just there, people are trying to jump into something and everyone wants to get into the next big thing so fast. And look, oh, we got Meerkat, we got Periscope, just got bought by Twitter. The stuff is coming out. This is a big thing. Personal streaming, personal news breaking, you know, all this stuff. People want to jump into it because they think it's going to be the next Twitter. Mm -hmm. They think that whether it's Meerkat or periscope or the third one the fourth one the fifth one they think this is what's going to be the next big thing they want the next twitter they want the next facebook yep and uh it's it's not this i'll tell you that it's it's not this you know dead mouse taking a ride to mclaren all of this stuff people are so excited to get on this so at the end ben popper says does this Mean Meerkat is going to thrive. The backlash and scrutiny from the press that built them up will no doubt be brutal. And it's tough to compete with a product being pushed by the same platform you're relying on for distribution and engagement. They have millions in the banks and some very famous funders. I think mobile live streaming is here to stay. You'll have to stay tuned to see who survives. Who's calling me from Sanford, Florida? Do you know anyone in Sanford? Well, my my old not. area code. No, I don't. What do they want? Well, it's almost time to get uh, Mr. Veen. Should I do this before or after him? Because um, it may go on. He talks. He talks. He is a talker. Well. You know what I'm saying? He is He is quite a talkative person. I don't want to do, cut him off. You could do it now. I'll do like. the quick Wealthfront spot now because I do like the Wealthfront. Let me tell you about Wealthfront. It's an automated investment service that man, and then I got to do that, the thing at the end, the, the quick uh, disclaimer. I'm getting good at this. You disclaimer. are. You're getting really good. I couldn't even get through the first two I'm words. trying to work up, Hattie, to, to get it so that I can get it down to about eight seconds. But I think that's a stretch. <laughs> Automated investment service that makes it easy to invest your money the right way. You set it and you forget it. If you're young and uh, you're earning money, you know, you thought about how should I be investing for my future? People always say I should be investing. How do I do it? I don't know. Uh, you know, you want to put your money to work for you in an investment portfolio. If you're closer to retirement age, you want to be a little more conservative with it. But who has the answers? Well, I'll tell you who. You go and you you, uh, you make an appointment with a local broker. And uh, you set aside a few hours to spend with them in person with all your documents. You do a lot of phone calls. That sounds like a lot of fun, right? Like that sounds like a fun way to spend a Thursday afternoon. Super fun. No, it's not fun, Hattie. <laughs> with Wealthfront, you get to skip all of that. You sign up online. You're up and running in five minutes. You answer a few questions that help them determine your risk tolerance to fund your portfolio. And you get started immediately. It's really, really simple. Couldn't be easier. And they do it all for 0.25% per year, which is less than a quarter of the cost of a traditional investment advisor. They manage over $2 billion in client assets. 
and 5 by 5 listeners can get their first 10,000 managed for free if you go to wealthfront.com slash 5 by 5 wealthfront.com slash 5 by 5 Here's a disclaimer. You ready? They I'm say, ready. I have to read this. Uh, I have to. I like By law, I have to read this. So here we go. Wealthfront, oh, I'm always messing up first time. It's okay. Wealthfront Inc. is an SEC registered investment advisor. Brokerage services are offered through Wealthfront Brokerage Corporation, member FINRA and SIPC. This is not a solicitation to buy or sell securities, investing in securities involved, and there is a possibility of losing money past performance. There's no guarantee of future results. Please visit Wealthfront.com to read the full disclosure. I stumbled one part. It's okay. I think that was the it's fastest there. you've ever, ever gone on, on that. It. It's not what she said. Is <laughs> Jeff Veen, is Jeff Veen ready he to be on the show? He is ready to go. Want me to give him a call? Why don't you give Jeff Veen a call and uh, we'll get him. We'll get Jeff Veen on the, on the air. A more conservative with Jeff. Hello? <laughs> Jeff, it's been so long since we talked. Welcome to the show. Jeff Veen. Hello. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Dan? My gosh. It's been years since we talked. The last time that I, 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 I know we've talked a little bit here and there, but, uh, but the last time you were on a show, could it have been the episode you did with Merlin of the conversation all those years ago? Is that possible? Oh, oh my God. I can't. It, could, it very well could be. I've been very busy since then. You have been. Let, so let, I was looking at your, uh, at your, your about me page. I was mm -hmm. looking at your, the Wikipedia page on you. Because I wanted to make sure I didn't forget anything. So, but let me let me try and run through this. A lot of people know you as uh, the incredibly handsome oh, wizard Dan, Dan. from uh, from you know you you did that. First of all, that amazing the amazing book, the art and science of web design. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. I went to get in it. No offense, but it's I I have it in it's. It, we moved when we moved from Florida to Texas. I took my special books, which yours is one of them, and uh, I also had the the Zeldman book in there, mm -hmm. and I they're in a they're at home, they're on my shelf at home, and I didn't get to bring it in. I wanted to hold up because it has half your face on it. I'm gonna hold it up half in front of my face, but that's all right. <laughs> so that you did that, Adaptive Path. A lot of people right. know about that place. Right. You did the Type Kit, which got acquired by Adobe, and then you went and you ran you ran Adobe for a while, the international. Uh, Adobe company. I uh, well, uh, I'm not. Don't sure be modest with me. <laughs> you ran Adobe, and then you uh, you do the True Ventures now. That's right. That's how right. how do you, how does little... one person do all of it? It's not Jeff. Talk there, me through this. Well, there was a little detour in there as well. What I miss? We uh, we uh, while we were at uh, Adaptive Path, we made a little product called Measure Map, which we sold to Google. Oh, yeah. That became Google Analytics. Analytics. So Forgot that one. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. That's just um, a blip for you, though. That's like, you know, I got a haircut on Thursday. Oh, I sold another company to Google. So what? Um, you know, I, I appreciate that, Dan. That's, that's a nice way to sort of frame everything. Another way to frame it is to say I have a very short attention span. So uh -huh. you could you could look at it either way. <laughs> um, but no, yeah. So it's um, it's been a tremendous amount of fun uh and i'm doing stuff now that i feel uh almost completely uh unequipped to do which is always a p place i really like to be if that makes sense tell, tell me what you mean by that because it anybody who would look at your career at the body of work that you've managed to create at the tools and applications and services that you've put together that people use in 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 such a you know i was i was watching this movie uh, uh, the, uh, imitation game oh, about, great. about Alan Turing. Yep. And it occurs to me that he is so much in, in so many ways, the father of what we think of as computers, algorithms, so many other things. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, you know, we're so focused on like the new feature of iOS, right. Or, or whether Meerkat or Periscope is the next big thing that it's so easy to forget that there was a time when it, we didn't, it's not like we didn't have computers like we have today. We didn't have the notion of computers at all, like of what we think of and take so for granted. I will now compare you to Alan Turing by saying so many of the things that you've made are just, they're a given. They're the things that we, they're, they're such a part of the basic building blocks of what we do 
Uh, of course you're going to have nice fonts on a website. You know, of course you can get really good analytics. Like, it's a foregone conclusion. You're the guy who's, like, built all of this stuff. How, I mean, do you ever wake up in the morning and be like, you look in the mirror and you're like, yeah, that's right, I'm Jeff Veen. No. Like, does that happen? Because I think that no, that's no. what I would do if we had, like, a Freaky Friday situation going on. I would just be staring in the mirror and being like, yeah, I'm, I'm Jeff Veen now. So look, a, few, a, a couple minutes ago you said don't be humble, but but honestly, uh, it is. I, I didn't build those things. A group of us built those things. Yes. And um, and one of the things that I'm most grateful for in my career is the unbelievably talented people that I've had the uh, the, the great pleasure to collaborate with. So all of these things that I have done in the past come from, um, I think. Uh, 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 amazing relationships, uh, as well as this sort of ability to, for all of us, to uh, kind of work really hard to put ourselves in a position to be lucky. Yeah. If that makes oh, sense. Oh, I love that. I love that because there is that famous quote that, you know, I, I, I believe in, is this Thomas Jefferson? I believe in luck. The harder I work, the more I have. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but it, it just it's it strikes me that you've been whether it was you or whether it was the amazing team that you worked with that you were like you were like there at each of these key moments when something uh, amazing came out and you know we've reminisced together on this show uh, or on other shows rather uh, about you know the good old days of when there were like eight people building stuff like this and now it seems like you know, every single day there's some kind of a new, whether it's a new service or a new technology. And earlier in the show, I was talking about, you know, personal video streaming, right? Uh, live mobile streaming, if you will, you know, and, and there's always the next big thing. And for a while, the next big thing was just the web, you know, and, uh, and, and you were, you were one of the instrumental key people. Where do you feel like with the perspective that you have, where, where are we now and where are we going? Like when you sit there and at, at your, you know, at, at true, at the big desk at true ventures, <laughs> yeah. what, what do you see? And like, where, where are we going? Uh, uh well, uh, I wouldn't have taken the job and maybe I should tell you a tiny bit about what I'm doing. Yeah, now. please that, do. That might get, be some framing, but, but, uh, to finish that thought, I don't, I don't think I would have taken the job if I didn't think that the web was still the next big thing that, um, uh, every, Every single thing we think or say or do is basically happening uh, in a in a connected way, yeah. and that we haven't even scratched the sur surface of what's of, it, of what we're going to be doing. Um, and I think we all get I have the sense that the rate of change is what is growing the fastest, right? Like that. I uh, I just think there's um, we're we're still at the beginning. If if uh, if the web were the like video games, we'd still be at the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, right? You know what I mean? Still, like, you're saying still today, we're still, still at today? that level. Oh my God, yes. Oh yeah. my God, yes. Um, and I don't know if the web of five or ten or twenty years from now has browsers and HTML and and all of that, but it doesn't matter because the foundations will always be there, right? And the way that we connect people up and the way that we communicate with each other uh, and design those communications. I think will will always be there, and so everything that we started with our career, those old timers, like, uh, well, I'll put myself in that in that category. Sure. You may do so if you like. Sure. Um, but you know, like the the foundations that we started, I think that's the that's the big platform we're going to build on for a long, long time. And so I'm thrilled. I'm continuously thrilled about that. So what is it that you're doing these days? So I took a job as design partner at True Ventures. Now True Ventures is a, a VC firm. Uh, they've been around for eight, eight years now, I think, um, and have uh, funded just a bunch of companies that you've heard of. You can go look at their website to see the whole list. But the, one of the companies they founded was funded rather was Typekit. Uh, so I got to know them uh, about six years ago when we started that project. Um, uh, and many of them uh, had been friends of mine from before. In fact, one of the partners at the time uh, who's still there, uh, Tony Conrad, was a client of Adaptive Path. And again, it's part of that whole um, interwoven story of working hard to be lucky, right? We were able to raise funding for Typekit because we had worked with people in the context of Adaptive Path and, and on and on and on. It all sort of, you know, the story unfolds that way. So uh, after we built Typekit and grew Typekit, then sold Typekit to Adobe, I spent three and a 
what was it, three and a half years uh, at Adobe, kind of running product for uh, and product design for all of the Creative Cloud stuff. So really kind of uh, helping this 30-year-old company stop selling their products and treat them more like services, more like all the other things that we use these days, right? So uh, we built a subscription model and a, and a sort of a creative profile uh, system for people who use Adobe products. And that was enormously rewarding to see that that transition happen in a company that you would assume is actually pretty conservative in right. the way they approach right. risk. Yeah, right? I mean, so. they are they are the old school of old school companies when you think about how long they've been around. Photoshop 1.0, System 7, like that's... You know, 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. forever in our, in our terms. Right. Postscript, right? right? Like that's way back there. Um, so yeah, so we, um, so so you know when I and when I got to Adobe, this is and this is just what about 2011, mm -hmm. 2012, mm -hmm. in the, right? That doesn't sound that long ago, but they were still like primarily putting the software on discs into boxes that went onto trucks that went to stores. Wow. So to turn that into what if Photoshop had a freemium model right. is was huge. Yeah. So uh, it was a bunch of work and it was really rewarding work and a lot of fun. Um, uh, but but um, like I said, short attention span, right? Mm. So um, so after that amount of time, I was again like starting to think about what to do next and and talking to my friends over at True Ventures because right. obviously if I was going to do something. If I was going to start another thing, and 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 that thing was going to be venture backed and financed that way, I would um, certainly be talking to them again. And we started talking about, well, wait a minute, what if we did something, you know, even uh, a little more in depth? Uh, and this is also around the time when a couple of kind of high profile design people, designers, took jobs at BC firms. So John Maida, who was the right. president of RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design. He went over to Kleiner Perkins as a design partner. And then Irene Au, who uh, coincidentally was my boss over at um, Google, mm -hmm. she was the uh, vice president of user experience over at, at Google. She went over to Coastal Ventures as a design partner. And maybe you've seen some of the stuff that Google Ventures, the, yeah. the, the, the investment arm of Google, uh, what they've done with with. Interestingly, again, coincidentally, again, some of the some of my old team right. at Google is now working there as uh, uh, at Google Ventures as designers that work with the startup portfolio mm -hmm. and and help them out with research and design sprints and usability testing and things like that. So that's all to say what, that it was kind of in the air, and I thought and I thought that could be that could be a really interesting way of of kind of of leverage, right? How can I have more impact and, and be more helpful to the way that products are being developed now and the way that people are thinking about design. And so, and so, um, I decided to do that. So I'm joining them and doing kind of have two main focuses. One is around helping the, the true portfolio, right? And there's dozens and dozens and dozens of companies that we've invested in and all of them are growing. And, um, and, uh, as you can imagine, have various, need for and capabilities around the product design process and strategic thinking about product design um, all the way down to the real tactical like we need a designer or I need an agency to help me with my brand or right whatever. right so I I act in almost a consultant like uh, capacity around but all this of that. is perfect for you with the short attention span right because you get to kind of shift gears and work with different companies and work in a, in those different dynamics of that like what other what other job would give you that and make that actually your job? Like, how can you get yeah, bored? Right? It, it, it is like my old gig at Adaptive Path where I was a consultant, except I don't have to sell, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice. And so how um, does it work? I mean, the, the better the companies do, the better the, the better True Ventures does and the better you do in, in turn. Is that sort of the general concept of, of the way yeah. something like that works? Absolutely. Look, in, in, invest... In, Venture capital is no different from any other kind of investment in that you want as much return as you can get for as little risk as possible. So right. how, what's the best way to reduce risk? Well, there's a bunch of ways that you can do that. One of them I fundamentally believe is that the better the user experience of the product you're selling, right, the more likely it is your company will succeed. Right. It seems so obvious to, you know, when, you, when you put it that way, <laughs> yeah. but it's so hard in practice. And so that's what uh, I hope to help with.
Well, it's very um, cool. Are you still involved in uh, with Adobe at all? They just came out with this, uh, the, you know, the the visual storytelling app for the iPad. Product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. Um, uh, except that I have many, many friends there now. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're always chatting and whatnot. Um, but uh, but uh, no, I am um, 100%. 100% of my time is on true or the true portfolio companies. Um, so for example, I'm spending about a bunch of time sort of uh, leading the product direction right now for a company called about.me, which I think, I think you just mentioned, right? Where yeah. And I, I've got your, I've got your about.me page for, for the, for the kids at home to watch. I've got you up there. Uh, that, I, I, yeah. That, that product is a, um, is a phenomenally fast growing uh, example of one of true's companies that, um, uh, you know, was sort of at a, at a pivotal moment in their history. Uh, the guy who ran product for them um, kind of stepped off to a different opportunity, a great friend of mine, Ryan Freitas, uh, who is now over at Uber. Um, and so in this transitionary, like what, who can, uh, you know, set the kind of direction for the product for about.me, I stepped in over there and doing some work with them. Um, but that's kind of half of it, right? That's the helping the portfolio. The other half is actually investing and finding companies that are um, uh, that, that are in the areas that I know about. Um, and yeah, what kind of companies uh, do you guys look for? What do you what 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 would pique your interest in 2015? For me, uh, one of the things that I am particularly interested in. Well, there's a very broad category of just. I think that companies can and should often be led by people with design in their background, mm. right? And so we hear a lot about companies like Airbnb, right. Pinterest, uh, who are founded by a pair of designers, right? And in both of those cases, that's happened. Or other companies, even, uh, you know, Twitter is a company that has design at its core, right? There's, right. So I think uh, that is not just um, something I'm interested in. I think it's kind of table stakes these days, that uh, a deep focus on a user experience of a product is has to be part of the DNA of the company. So um, at a very early stage, when a company is two people or four people or something like that, uh, teasing out uh, whether this design-driven company is something that could potentially be big and world-changing is, uh, is really exciting. So that's part of it. Um, the other part is I'm actually still very interested in how we make the stuff that uh, we all consume every day. So design and development tools and that whole stack, right? Everything from very low level stuff, you know, um, one of True's portfolio companies is Puppet, right? It's one of those DevOps tools that helps do code deploys. Yeah, I remember back in, in my, my Rails uh, days when I was working at that Rails hosting company, like everything was Puppet by that point. And it's, right. you know, it's amazing how a technology like that, that, that is, again, is used every day behind the scenes that so many people don't don't know about but yet like it shows up on your radar i think that's pretty fascinating well i i think as a as certainly as somebody who thinks about product strategy you have to think about how things are made right and the more you can get better at making stuff the more opportunity you have to iterate a design and so the 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 way that we built typekit was thinking all the way up and down that stack about what tools can we be using to make this as efficiently and effectively as possible to give us the most flexibility. So that's why I think super low level, like command line tools like Puppet or a little bit higher up the stack like GitHub mm -hmm. or higher up, you know, like some of the prototyping tools that are out there for designers to use. All of that stuff contributes to making better products and I love that whole field. So I look a lot at stuff like that. The tools we use to make the stuff that's in our app stores or on uh, or behind our URLs. Right. Um, I, I have a particular interest these days in, in how teams collaborate, uh, how people do their work, especially people in, the, in what we have, for lack of a better term, called the creative fields. Right. Um, I think that, well, I just mentioned GitHub, and, and there are many reasons why GitHub was such a huge shift in how we do development. Um, everything from the forking model to the, you know, basically being built on this open source contribution yeah. concept and yeah. all of that stuff. Phenomenal. But what I really like about it is that the repo became the documentation. So you right. have this, this sense of memory for how you've developed a particular product available to just browse. And it's really no additional work for the mm -hmm. people who are contributing. 
So it's almost like our whole product becomes, in a way, self-documenting. And you can right. kind of go back and look at everything that's happened, all the change logs, all the pull requests, all that stuff, to see what we have, like, what have we, you know, what have we built? Right. Nothing like that exists on the front end for design, mm -hmm. right? Like, the biggest shift in the last 10 years for how we practice design as teams has been, right. well, we have shared drop boxes now. Which is, you know, which is <laughs> no, great. but I mean, oh you're right. God, you're right. Like we have a shared Dropbox, and you know, you can go get that old version before you know Frank screwed it up. But we don't, we don't have anything like that on the design side. But isn't that because of the challenges of doing something like that? Because it, you know, with with code, it's text, and you can so easily roll something back and say, well, these five lines were added, and a computer. It's very easy for a computer to look at it and say. Oh yeah, that's that's the diff between these two files. Is these five lines are different? I mean, aren't there inherent challenges in in design uh, that 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 don't work as well? Or are there tools that we can still make, or someone like Adobe has to make? You know. Well, that's the thing, right? Is uh, what I hear you saying is that sounds incredibly valuable, but it's too hard. Too hard. Right. Those are the well, good problems, right? That's a good problem. Yeah. I think. If we were sitting here six, seven years ago and saying the, the lamenting the state of web design because you only had five fonts, we would have this huge argument about like, well, the foundries will never agree to put their fonts on web servers and, and the right. browsers aren't even supporting it yet. It's just too hard. Right. So looking for things that sound really valuable but are currently still a little too hard, I think are where where opportunity comes from. So um so I think, yeah, you know, do you attack the problem of this institutional design memory right. that we lack? Right. Do you attack that at the mock-up level, at the collaboration level, at the delivery level? I don't know. I think you probably do it all of it. Yeah. I think it's hard to get people to stop using Photoshop to make web pages. <laughs> uh, so I don't think you necessarily have to. But I think Photoshop is becoming more open and and um and more and the, the output of Photoshop is becoming more structured and the way in which we collaborate uh is getting more fluid and all of these things are coming together that I think um I think there's I think that's just a big open beautiful area to go look at. And it seems like, you know, there are a lot of people who agree with you and obviously there's there's a lot of money to be invested. I there was an interesting one I, I uh, spoke at this thing called Startup Riot that was in Atlanta where a lot of, you know, it was pretty much just Atlanta focused businesses. There were 30 of them, 30, you know, very, very, very early stage. Some, in some cases, just idea stage companies. Yeah. And, uh, one of them and, uh, had, Anna, you were there and uh, I, I already forgot the name of the one company, but which was the one about where they would watch you, uh, you would like get a, a designer or a developer oh, uh, who would, you that, get to watch them. Was it watch me work? So, yeah. Watch me work or something like that. Was. And, and it's, it's interesting to me that, that there are different kind of other companies starting up in this space where, you know, the idea of watching somebody else code or watching somebody else design and listening to their thinking process and watching this process that they go through is still so fascinating. I mean, look at the success uh, Dan Cedarholm has had with dribble, uh, the, the, the idea of sharing and, and uh, all the, the, the way that we get uh, the stuff that we're working on out in front of other people while we're working on it, before it's done, you know, before uh, it's just that that whole mentality. It used to be, oh, we're going to come out with a beta and a beta means that it's really, really not done and use it at your own risk. And then eventually beta kind of took the form of, uh, yeah, everything's a beta now. Like, of course, you're in the beta and then, you know, Gmail was in beta for uh, for so long that we right. forgot that it hadn't been released and, you know, and, <laughs> and then we sort of encoded that yeah. as practice as the minimum viable product as actually a good marketing strategy. Right. right. So, yeah, I agree. Uh, I think one of the things we haven't gotten very good at, uh, is, uh, paying down technical debt and design debt that comes from doing things that way. But, um, but tell me more know, about that. Tell me more. What do you mean paying down design debt? Well, well, the, the idea behind the minimum viable product is to get something in front of a set of users as quickly as you can mm -hmm. uh, uh, and as low cost as you can mm -hmm. as a way to evaluate if it's effective so you can learn from that. Right. So you can imagine, right, like you start your, your company and you're going to build a product and you go away and hide for 18 months and you make it a fully robust version one and then launch it without ever having shown anybody, Right very risky thing to do yeah some these to be the normal way now forget about it 
Yeah, right. Yeah. As opposed to working for three months and having something that kind of works, it's um, maybe got 10% of the feature, but the core is there, um, and launching that, getting a little bit of early traction, and listening and watching to what your users are saying and doing. And, um, and that can be a good way to learn, right? And it's an effective way to learn. And then you do another launch, right? We have, all, we have this whole stack that, in, that enables the flexibility to be able to uh, develop and design and push new versions of our software multiple times a day. That's been a huge innovation over the last 10 years. So we've, so we've got that process in place so that we can continuously improve the product over time. But the thing is, it's very difficult to go back and do something uh, and fix something because you were moving so fast and just wanted to get it out there yeah. and you wanted to get it in front of people to then go back and to, you know, as, as a lot of the developers I work with would say, actually do it properly. Mm -hmm. Like going to make sure it's really robust and this thing is... It's working really well with our 1,500 users, but what's it going to be like with, with 1.5 million, right. you know, that kind of stuff? And we do the same thing with design, right? Like we get into this iterative process where we are changing and testing and learning and doing and stuff like that without ever really going back and saying, is this the best way to do it? Or are we approaching the local maxima, right? So I think all of these things just kind of contribute to a lot of momentum without a lot of the depth that we often associate with really robust and mature products. Now, what are your thoughts on something like Kickstarter? I mean, the idea that now we don't, uh, it, it, I mean, looking at this again, you talk about going into a, into a basement for 18 months, right? And then you build something, you could do that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, or maybe even less than that, because they're really, you, the competition wasn't so agile and so fast. And now I think that's one of the big reasons why, you know, people, and again, I don't want to keep referencing it, but this was just, it's been on my mind this morning, the whole meerkat periscope thing, you know, the idea that if you look back over our history of, of things being invented, you had multiple people working on, you know, the light bulb at the same time, it seems like there, there's this critical mass that gets, that gets reached and a whole bunch of people are, are for whatever reason, getting a, a, a similar idea at the same time and working on it and, and creating it. So now we have to, but then you look at something like Kickstarter and you figure that into it, that people are there saying, we don't even have anything or we just have the basics of something. And we really want to get this out there. We don't even have the beta. We're not building something for one month and then releasing it. We're not building it at all. Unless you guys step forward and say that you want it and you're ready to, to, to pay for it. You know, how does that factor into the, the, the way that things are being created and built and, and launched today? Well, yeah, I mean, talk about a uh, uh, high signal right. uh, into whether you, that your idea is something that could potentially be viable. Kickstarter is phenomenal. I think what Kickstarter has also done is uh, illustrated for us in a, in a pretty painful way that developing hardware products is like we don't have that flexibility of the software stack, right? right? The ability to like quickly iterate, prototype, get something out. I have a good friend that went through product development for a piece of hardware in the Kickstarter process. And you just, you don't, you generally when you're, when you're starting at the idea stage and the design stage for a piece of hardware, most of the people on Kickstarter aren't realizing the difficulty of getting their finished product through customs in China. Oh, right. Like we did, right? right? And we'll figure that out, yeah. right? That's like, there will be pieces of infrastructure that help and already are. Like yeah. there's a lot of startups that are helping other startups to make hardware products, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and to make that more fluid and faster and, and lower risk and lower cost. Right. But I think that's a, one of the things that Kickstarter has really shown us is that hardware is harder and, um, and we can't take the kind of um, the approach we have to developing software platforms and products. Uh, so I don't know. I think we, I think this is all part of the maturing of our industry. Yeah. Yeah, no, it definitely is. I think we're, you know, it, I'm, I'm always thinking, trying to think ahead because, you know, that's, I've, I've been doing this for a long time, you know, back in the days, I, I still remember like so vividly, you know, waiting in line to buy windows 95 and very concerned how I was going to, you know, upgrade the, our windows for work groups client, you know, and like all of this, this whole like it 
legacy world that I used to be in and then moving into software development and watching that change and you know all of these different iterations of things that that uh, we've seen uh, and and watch the world of technology change to now you know we're about to get this incredibly insanely powerful little computer on our wrist right like all of these uh, changes that come that seem like uh, they take forever like I'm not going to get to to see that Apple Watch until the 24th. Like that's a million years from now, right? <laughs> but like no. not that long ago it didn't e exist in anyone but, you know, the few people at at Apple's awareness and not that long ago we didn't even have a phone where if you touched the screen on the phone it you just smudged it, it didn't do anything. You know, that wasn't that long ago. I remember the first time that I got a, a mobile phone and how, you know, what that was like, like that doesn't feel to me like that long of a time ago. But if you look at how fast things are moving and how fast things are changing, you know, I guess my last question for you today is where, where do you see if, if you were somebody who's sitting, you know, at their desk in, 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 you know, working in technology, writing code, doing design, and they're thinking, man, I, I want to be a part of that next big thing. Like, what should they what should they be looking at? Solving those hard problems? Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously, it's almost there's this trope around um, the, the idea you can't stop thinking about. Right. But yeah, um, the the, the I, like I said earlier, the opportunity is phenomenal um, for for what is still left to be built. Um, I think if if any of us knew what would be coming next. Uh, you know, we'd probably all be retired by now. So you, you can't, it's, it's hard to say, let's, uh, uh, you know, let's all go work on this one thing. But I think you're absolutely right that the rate of change is what's changing so fast. Like it's just getting so exponential. Like I have two kids, one is five and one is three, who have never experienced technology without touch screens. In mine too. Same right. exact, same as the minor seven and three, same exact experience. Like, and, the, and they laugh at, uh, daddy's laptop right. where he has to push buttons and everything. Right. It's like, you know, I'm still, <laughs> you're like operating I'm, a big piece of machinery almost like, you know, it's, it, 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 you're right. What a different right. world they're growing up in. And the, the difference there is in the abstraction, right? That mm -hmm. was something that was just so clear to me as my kids who had been using an iPad since birth, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, now my son is re learning to read and write and his letters and all that kind of stuff. And so I sit with him with my laptop. We do a little Minecraft. He's getting it, yeah, right? Yeah. All of that stuff. And um, and this idea, like the trackpad, as a thing that you put your finger down here to move a thing that's uh, up there. Yeah. And and I see him, right? Like when we use our iPads, that abstraction is gone. But it, there's still a different abstraction, right? Yeah it's still different from the way the world works. And that is <laughs> right. the direction when I see like, look, all of this stuff that, that was coming at, at CES this year, Microsoft's HoloLens mm -hmm. and Oculus Rift and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff is, man, not even the Atari 2600 of, of the mm. next wave. It's even way earlier than that. We right. have no idea what's going on and what it's going to be like. But the reaction that people have when they interact with a device like that it has just now gotten good enough to where people are like, whoa, the, holy crap, that, something's going on here. Something, yeah. And you're not the first person to, to bring that up, the concept of whether you want to call it virtual reality or, uh, or augmented reality, augmented reality or different things. But that whole concept uh, that, that used to seem so sort of sci-fi and far-fetched is now something that's that it will very, very soon just be a regular part of our life. But I remember it was uh, uh, probably about eight years ago I saw Edward Tufte speak, and he was talking back then. This is way before we had retina screens. Uh, he was just talking about the density of information, the resolution of the world around us is so much greater than anything we can see on screens, anything that's on a computer, anything that, that can be presented that way. And, and to your point, the way that computers work still, even if we're touching a screen, that's not the way the world really works. And yeah, think about, think about this example, right? Like the difference, the phenomenal, like huge leap of difference between a paper map and a map on your phone, mm. right? Where yeah. like you're the blue dot, you're always in the middle of the map. Like it's just phenomenal, like 
unbelievable amount of change there. Yeah. But imagine then again the the change in abstraction from looking at that phone with a with a you know this like visualization of a grid with you being the dot versus just looking down the street and being able to see the next turn. Yeah. Because that is what like our car windshields or are the glasses we wear or the lenses we put in our eyes or whatever. Like that's again removing even more abstraction so that it's just like technology feels like it's in the world. Yeah. In I mean, that high resolution, high information density world that Edward Tufte talks about. That that to me feels like well, that's something the kids are going to have to build because I'm getting a little tired. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but th that's that's I think that's a great way to, to to end it. But yeah, I mean, that's the future, the high res world that that we really want to we really want to be in. So if people want to uh, to catch up with you, uh, what where should they go to do this? If you're on you're you're just you're just Veen on Twitter, yeah. right? Yes. Is, is that a good place or should they go to yeah, some of your websites? that's probably the best place. Or they could come over. I'm in San Francisco. We could just have a little <laughs> coffee or yeah. something. Yeah. The next time uh, that I the next time I'm out there, we we've got to we've got to be because we've known each other o online. We've been or on the line as they say. On we've been online friends for a long time and I've never met you in person and uh so we got to we got to fix that. I think I got to come out. Absolutely we do. Yeah. Right. Come on over. Well, I sure do appreciate you being here uh today. Veen on Twitter. You can go to just a couple other things. It's it's uh, it's trueventures.com, and uh, if you know if if they're interested in seeing this amazing uh, amazing project projects plural that that you're working on there, uh, Typekit of course everybody knows, everyone knows Adobe too, uh, and now they know you if they haven't already. So thanks so much for for being here, uh, Jeff Veen. Jeff absolutely, Veen. thanks for, thanks for having me. This is absolutely a great time. Great to be come back again. I hope. Oh, you bet. Take care. What uh, what an amazing person. Yep. What a career he's And I had. have all that stuff in the show notes. And I also You were busy book. typing the yeah, whole time. Yeah, I, I was putting together all of this. So awesome. <laughs> uh, and I have his Can't book in the show he, notes, he, too. You remember when I was saying I was slumming it to be here. Right. This little two-bit right. operation here in Austin. He's like, he's like creating the future. I know. Out there. Such a nice guy, too. So cool. Like, if you want to know what cool... Like, who doesn't dream of being Jeff Veen one day? Like, that's the dream for all of us geeks out it's, there. You know what? I think be, you just discovered a, it. That's the American dream. Well, the geek, the geek American dream, for sure. So, uh, wow. what do you say after Jeff Veen? You end yeah. the show. You end the show. That's what you do. Yeah. After Jeff Veen is, is done, you say bye. So <laughs> that's what I'm going to say. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in uh, to the show today. We sure do appreciate uh, your listenership and your viewership. Uh, you can uh, tune in again tomorrow for the for for the Big Friday show. We will be here at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 10 Central, 8 Pacific, right here from Austin, Texas. At, two awesome uh, guests. Two awesome guests tomorrow. Who do we have? Uh, we have Aaron and Dave from Homework. Homework. Yep. That's that's the show that's taking the world by storm. Yep. Everyone's talking about Everyone's it. Everyone's talking about it. Uh, more downloads than us, so we'll figure out what they're doing. And uh, thanks uh, very much again to to Jeff Veen for being here. And uh, thanks to you for listening. We'll be back tomorrow morning. See you then.